Good morning, everybody. We're, we're boisterous this morning. That's good. We enjoy fellowship. So I'm just going to read a few announcements off the back of our bulletins. They're out in the uh, foyer there. Uh, first of all, we've got several guests with us today. Thank you for coming and welcome. Keep in mind, we do have a potluck afterwards, and whether or not you brought anything, all are welcome. We enjoy sitting down and talking with each other and, and, and you as well. So feel free to stay after the service is over this morning. We also had a good time with Roger, Charlene, and Marcus's place last night. It was the uh, annual event, so to speak. Uh, we, had a, we had a great time, and probably most of us ate too much. But So hopefully we're all out of the food coma this morning. Uh, but keep in mind that we have a gathering July 3rd at the Myers House, so get ready for the next one. Uh, for uh, prayer concerns, um, thank, thank the Lord for uh, Paul's good report from the uh, ER. He'll be following up with doctors on, on that, but there was no heart attack. So keep in mind the Campbells are still traveling, and I understand that they are flying out of Kentucky this week and headed to Missouri. And uh, we also want to keep uh, the Cummins family for John Cummins. He has terminal bone cancer. For Mike Schwartz, he's recovering from surgery, and I don't know how many heart attacks he's had, but um, probably two were the most recent. Two recent. Two recent. He's, he's had more. So let's, let's pray for him and, and his family. Um, and also for uh, Jack and Kathy Eisen uh, for the passing of Jack Jr. Uh, we also want to keep in mind uh, Shalisa's mom. She's having surgery. Her name is Gail Young. So please pray for Shalisa's mom. Uh, she'll be having surgery this week. And uh, I got the opportunity to meet uh, Mark and Mara this morning, so welcome. And if there is nothing else, our first song... Uh, if, before we go to our Father in prayer, our first song, if you'll turn to your book, song number 396, Roger will be leading us in song this morning. And also keep in mind that after potluck this afternoon, the men will have a leadership meeting. So for the men who uh, typically attend that, please, please stay. And yes, Jill. Ah, the miners will be hosting a fellowship in August, so we have plenty of opportunities for food comas now. <laughs> so, but more importantly, we have opportunities for great fellowship. So if, if anyone can attend, please, uh, please feel for, welcome to, to come and join us all. It's uh, always a good time, and maybe I can convince Jeff to um, pull out the band, uh, what, the, the, no, the mandolin, not the banjo. It, he does that? Okay. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, um, please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful, we're so happy and joyous to be gathered here as your family, as your children here this morning, with the express purpose of worshiping you. Please be with those who lead this hour of worship. Please be with their hearts and their and give them the words to say, please be with Paul as he presents the second in a series of lessons he's presenting to us from Acts. Please guide us all in all of the struggles that we face and help us to look confidently toward you, knowing that nothing can be insurmountable with you as, as our leader, with you as our guide, as long as we know your love, and we know the hope of heaven after this mortal life upon earth is over. Please help us to persevere, help us to be strengthened in your love and in your word. Please guide us now, help us to be mindful as we worship you this morning. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. This morning as we gather around the table here to partake of the Lord's Supper, partake of the emblems, the bread, 
the fruit of the vine that represents Christ's body and his blood. The song we just sang talked about Jesus in the garden. And I would like to read a passage in Matthew chapter 26 where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And we always think of the crucifixion being the most gruesome for him. But I think this was the very start of it because this was the mental agony that he was going through in the garden. Starting in verse 36 of chapter 26 of Matthew, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. As we look at those words, he prayed three times, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass. But it wasn't his will. His will was for him to go through the suffering and the agony of death on the cross. We were reading this morning in our class in Romans chapter 8 and it was talking about the Spirit. And I happen to glance back and, and it reminds me when you go back to Romans chapter 3, it says there's none righteous, no, not one. Then it says the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. He went through all of this for us even though we were still sinners. As we gather around this table and partake of these emblems, we need to remember what He has done for us. Because we are, we were nothing. But when we are in Christ, we are something. We are His children. So as we partake, Let's remember that sacrifice that began in the garden. Something that we can understand. When he sweat blood. We haven't been put to that test yet. But as we partake, let's remember that sacrifice that was given for us. Our Heavenly Father. We come before you this morning to give, to worship you and to give thanks for the sacrifice Jesus made as he suffered and died on the cross for our sins. As we partake of this bread which represents his body, let us do so in a manner pleasing to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we now partake of the fruit of the vine represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross for remission of our sins. Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity you have blessed us with to come together to remember the sacrifice that was made for us. We thank you for sending Christ to, to die in our stead so that we may have eternity with you in heaven. Please forgive us of our sins and help us to partake in a manner pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we take up a, an offering, a contribution of what we've been so richly blessed with this week. We 
give back to the Lord what what is do him I guess we 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 can never outgive God ever he's given more than we could ever imagine but he has blessed us with so much and this country is richly blessed to the point that we need to give richly as it says in <clears throat> first Corinthians we should sow if we sow sparingly we're going to reap sparingly if we sow generously we will reap generously and always reminded of how the Macedonians gave they gave gave of the Lord because they were they were wanting to be a part of the the ministry so they gave first to God so as we give today let's remember that what we giving what we are giving is only giving back to what he has given us let's pray our father and God in heaven we are so thankful for this opportunity that we have to give back to you that father we can give willingly not because we have to but father because we want to and the father you would just continue to to bless the gift as well as the giver that you would help us to be good stewards with this money and that we can reach many in this community as well as abroad helping those that need help ministering to them and father preaching the gospel to the many that need it just guide us as we give for we ask these things in jesus name amen good morning last since the last time i looked back some folks snuck in on me this morning good to have some dear old I, oh, I slipped old in there. Good to have some dear friends from Meridian here with us today. Uh, and the other part fits too, doesn't it? <laughs> we are blessed to be together today to have guests with us. Certainly to worship together. How great that is, in fact, to be so privileged. If you are convinced of a truth... If you are convinced of a danger, what will you do? If it's a matter of life and death, what will you say? More so if it's a matter of spending eternity in heaven and hell, or hell, what will you do? You'll do something, because God did. And God did is what I'm calling this series of lessons that we're drawing from the book of Acts. We have in recent weeks in our consideration of making a, a more devoted, increased effort to reaching out to the lost in our community, we need to be convinced of these facts ourselves and the truth of this message. And God did. That title comes from Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, where it said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did. While these lessons are drawn from the book of Acts, I want you to go with me first back to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Here we find evidence that God's ways are indeed infinitely higher than man's ways. God's mercy is indeed great and marvelous. And his devotion to giving life is amazing. Unlike man, who seems at times hardly to care about others, certainly not to give much. The natural man doesn't tend to give much concern for others. But certainly in 2 Samuel 14, we see quite the difference. We find evidence that God's ways are infinitely higher, greater than man's. Amazing is his desire to give life. Thankfully, by God so desiring a relationship with man, he determined to make a relationship possible 
when because of sinning, a person is set at odds against God. Amazing is his response in 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 4. 2 Samuel 14 and verse 4. God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast away from him. Amazing. This is comparing the ways of an earthly king to an eternal king. When one offends an earthly lord or earthly master, the, the offender is banished, removed from his sight, without any plans or without any invitation to return. An earthly king then is pleased to cast the offender far away without any concern for life. However, our God mercifully considers the sinner. And though by the sin they are presently estranged from God, God determined, I will not cast them away. Rather, I have a plan by which I will prove my love. I will draw nearer to them and cause them to draw nearer, still nearer to me. God purposed I will make myself known to sinners so that they might come to know me. As we have considered and will consider in these lessons from the Acts, God planned, God purposed, and most especially God did. And awesome was the doing. Awesome, amazing is the doing in Acts chapter 2. On Pentecost, with the force of roaring wind, that spirit created such a stir that God-fearing men of every nation were asking, what does this mean? Acts 2 and verse 12. What does this mean? Well, in that context, it means that the gospel is for all. The church that is established on that day is big enough for all who will believe in the Son of God, the household of God, that household of God is meant for all to dwell within. It means that both that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. That's what all that noise and fire-breathed words and all that commotion and 12 men preaching at once, that was what it means. It's a church universal. Big enough for all who will believe in the Son of God. All this proves that God's heart is set. Not to cast away anyone. Not to cast away sinners. But to save them for Himself. Now that, acts, that answers the Acts 2 and verse 12 question. What does this mean? But we're going to continue to ask this question. Because knowing more than knowing what the Bible says. We do need to understand what it means. And then most especially to apply it to ourselves. In other words, how should I respond? It's the dread of any teacher, I suppose. The dread of any gospel teacher. That in teaching someone, rather than asking as these men do, what shall I do? That some will assume I don't need to do anything. Well, fortunately in this case, these men were not like that. In Acts 2 and verse 37. Those who were convinced of their guilt, convinced of their role in crucifying Jesus, those who were convinced of their guilt were also convicted to do something about it. Because of all that God did, and all that Jesus did to forgive sin and to give life, then surely they understood. We, we must do something. The question is what? Let's read about it. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified. And he kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Other translations will say, Save yourself from this crooked generation. 
But certainly you see in that that all those in that time, those living in their present at that day, and their descendants and their children's children and the children's grandchildren, this church that is established that day is for all. It's big enough for all who will believe in the Son of God. It proves that, that God has never had a desire, never had a plan, the intention to cast anyone away. Verse 37, it means that among the Jews, among those who are described in verse 5, is devout men from every nation. This, this message is powerfully convicting. The Spirit is working mightily in those good hearts creating in them the desire to hear and to heed and to do something. It is in such good hearts that we know from Romans 1 and verse 16 that the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And it is apparent in these men. It's apparent that salvation to everyone who believes requires their doing something. And these men are willing Apparently, they are ready to confess the truth that in Acts 2 and verse 36, that yes, they'll confess that for certain that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. They understand the one we killed is our only hope for life. Maybe it's because I had a little trip to the ER this week, but it's interesting what the lengths that people will go to for another hour of life. Maybe another day. Maybe another year. I mean, people get moving in that case. But so many, when you talk about the need for a Savior, the need for Christ, you can't get them to move sometime. They, people aren't really convinced they've got to do something. But these men are willing. They're willing. They're ready to do this. They're ready to obey Acts 2 and verse 2. 38. They're ready to do it just as it had said. To be baptized in this name for this reason. And if you do that, God will not only forgive you of your sin, He'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. These men knew they had to do something. And apparently they're ready. Seems that nothing would stop them. They're just waiting for the instruction. They're ready. And so, what will they do? The question we ask, again, is what does this mean? Most folks in the church have for many years been able to quote this book, chapter, and verse, and they know it well. But what does it mean? What does it require? What is the change that is being taught? Let's consider it. Repent. In simple English, it means to change your mind. It means to change your heart. Literally, it means to let your heart be changed. To be willing to let your heart be changed. That was the great problem among most of those Jews. No, we are what we are, and we are so sure of ourselves that we don't need anything. But be willing to let your heart be changed. In the hearts of those Jewish men to, who saw to it that Jesus was crucified. To repent means to change your mind. To change your attitude about Christ. And change your purpose to accept the will of God in the inner man. Be willing to change. God is saying there must be a radical change in mind and purpose so that we are turning away from sin. And even if we think we are so righteous and not much of a sinner, we're turning away from that too. And we're turning to doing the will of God. This is the radical change by which every believer brings forth fruit. Brings forth is producing evidence of that inward change. Jesus taught that, Luke 3 and verse 8. Bringing forth evidence of that inward change. Paul says much the same in Acts 26 and verse 20. That this person will perform deeds appropriate to repentance. Now that's Paul speak. That's preacher language. That's kind of theological talk. I've been reminded 
lately that, you know, Paul, you know, get it in plain language. Let's say it plainly. And yes, if we get out of the preacher speak, it means you're doing what is pleasing to God. Deeds appropriate to repentance. You're doing what pleases God. Beginning with what? Being baptized. Let each of you be baptized. Now God says so. Jesus and the Holy Spirit say so. The apostles say so. Meaning what? That we must momentarily be buried in water and then raised from that water. Now I know it runs counter to most religious traditions. The one in which I was born into, which said, well, just a few drops sprinkled on that baby's head will take care of that. Or other traditions that said, well, water poured over the head, that must be enough. It's counter to those who say it's unnecessary. But that's the point of this verse. It is necessary. It is a necessary process. There's a process of immersion, that's the going down. Of the submersion, that's the burial. And then the emergence, the raising up. Yes, it goes against the grain of, of many people. But it is a necessary process. When which kept, when done in the same way, results has the same result. Every time. Every time. Therefore, the conclusion of Peter's words is this. If one has not obeyed God in this manner, has been baptized in this manner, they haven't been baptized at all. I can't forget the man who angrily objects when I brought up that subject. He said, that's all you ever talk about. Well, maybe it seems so. Because we talk about it, because it seems everyone else or a great many people are trying to ignore the fact, trying to reject that truth. It, we talk about it because it is necessary. People, for the most part, are, are neglecting, they're ignoring, they're rejecting that mountain of scriptural evidence that proves it so. It's also necessary that it be in the name of Jesus Christ. Since in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, no other name given among, under heaven among men by which one can be saved. And so his truly is the name that is above all names. According to Matthew 28 and verse 19, a name above all names because he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, and it is Jesus himself who commanded baptism in his name. Now Jesus also explains in Mark 16 and verse 16 that the believer in, in doing this is expressing faith in him. Faith in what God did through him. Faith related to the salvation. And so the promise is this, that by obedience to the entire gospel, including Acts 2 and verse 38, one is brought into this relationship with God. That's what he said he desired all the way back in 2 Samuel and long before that. He wants a relationship and he did everything to make it possible. In this, we're brought into relationship with God and then we are acknowledged as being a disciple of Christ. How so? Well, so far by being baptized in the right form, in the right name, and then for the right reason, for the forgiveness of sin. I have no idea how many pages have been written trying to argue out this phrase. Some of you I've told in this, in my Bible, there's one verse about the necessity of baptism and the commentator have added four pages of fine print to prove it's not so. But one must be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Of course, it is contrary to the widely held view that, well, that baptism is separate from the forgiveness. The widely held view that someone is forgiven before the baptism. The testimony of having been granted forgiveness in the past. But this word for is so important. It, it means unto a desired condition. For 
unto what we need, not what we already have. For, this gets a little legalese sounding, but for sets a purpose in the order of the process. There's a purpose in this precise order of the process. Meaning in a divine order, when the brother submits to being baptized, or when a believer submits to being baptized, the forgiveness of sins will be granted. And so it isn't my teaching. It's not the teaching of the churches of Christ, per se. But it is of God who says that unless our baptism is according to this order, there is no means unto salvation. There is no other way than through this name. One is neither forgiven of their sins or given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And yet to whom is this gift given? It will be given to those like these men in Acts 2, verse 36 and verse 37. These men have already been changed. There they are, convinced of their guilt, convicted they must do something, and humbly, humbly asking, what shall we do? The Spirit will be given to those who have humbled themselves or been humbled by the power of the Word. But those who were humbled, about 3,000 that day were humbled. They were brought low under the conviction of their sin, brought lower by knowing they are banished from God, brought lower still by knowing that they cannot save themselves. And already what a change that is. What a change that is for, for a Jewish man. Think about it. For a Jewish man to be asking, what does this mean and what shall I do? That's as unlikely as a husband asking his wife for driving directions, isn't it? We don't like to do that. Well, this is, this is degrees beyond that. These men are asking and they are receiving the forgiveness that is promised and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at the same time they were baptized. Simply put, how's this work? Acts 5 and verse 32 says, the Holy Spirit is a gift. A gift whom God gives to those who obey Him. To those who obey Him. In many other passages that can be proven true, I've listed them there in the notes in the bulletin this morning. But this is certain. That we receive the forgiveness of sin. We receive the gift of life. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All that is promised at that time that we are saved. The gift is a blessing of God on the life He's given. We talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the blessing of God on the work that He has done. The gift is the approval of God for your obedience. Here is a person that heard the Word and heeded it and did what it said. And by their obedience, God's approval is on them. It's the, the first great blessing and in, in many, many blessings to come upon them. This gift takes us back full circle, back to 2 Samuel 14. And it proves that God does not take away life. God does not take away life. But He plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast away from Him. Yes, there's a separation by sin. But He made a way to pass that. He made a way to remedy that. The last thing He ever... Well, the one thing He never desired is to cast His children from Him. And so in miracles and wonders and signs, at Pentecost that entire plan was established. The meaning is clear. And perhaps to make it clearer, I need to do, as I mentioned earlier, get past the, the preachy words, the theological words, and say it in plain English. You need to have a change of mind that needs, leads to a change of life. You need to be buried in water, 
lowered in the water, raised up from the water, relying on your faith in Jesus so that your sins will be forgiven and God is approving your life. Nothing we really need more than God's approval on our obedience. God's approval on your life. That gift is merely the beginning of the blessings for those who hear and do what God has said. Luke chapter 11 and verse 28. Luke 11 and verse 28, it said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe his instruction. Well, again, I guess that gets into that preachery kind of language. Observe his instruction. It simply means happy are those who listen to God and do what he says. That's it, isn't it? Happiness, everybody's looking for happiness. Everybody is. Happiness is those who listen to God and do what he says. That is, in effect, what Acts 2.38 means. It's why Peter went on to say in verse 40, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Many translations say it that way. Some also say be saved from this perverse generation. But save yourself reminds us there's something that we must do. From this crooked generation, that's a loaded command. Because if you were alive at that time, you're of that generation, it means you're crooked. <laughs> it's the reality of it. Reminds me of the little story about the third grader. The teacher asked the third grader, Johnny, is the world round? He said, no. Well, is the world flat? He said, no. My daddy says it's not e neither round or flat. The whole world is crooked. Well, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. That would be a hard pill to swallow if you're one of those devout men in Jerusalem, wouldn't it? Devout men, those God-fearing men, seemed to be so holy up until that day they thought they were. But that's what God is saying through Peter. Everyone is crooked. Even if your ways are a whole lot better than your neighbor's ways. Even if you're religiously devout. Your sins, by your sins, it's perversion. You must change in order to save yourself. Perhaps the other translation is somewhat better in the sense that be saved from the perverse generation. That reminds us it is God who does the saving and only He can do so. He does so in response to the believer's faith in the death and burial and the resurrection. And so it might be better to be saved, say be saved from this generation because more than anything else, what do we need? We need a Savior. Put that little article on the front of the bulletin this morning for that reason. As to your need and to my need, isn't this true? You know, people oftentimes have this long list of needs and wants that if I just had this, I'd be happy. If somebody could answer this question, I'd be happy. No, listen to you're not just lonely in need of a friend, weak in need of a helper, ignorant in need of a teacher, confused in need of a counselor, bored and in need of some fun. You're drowning and in need of an ark. You're accused and in need of a city of refuge. You're a sinner in need of a sacrifice, in need of a great high priest, in need of a great physician. Unclean in need of the cleansing. You're lost and you need a Savior. That's who we are and that's who everyone is. To be saved, we are in need of a Savior. Whether it is to be saved initially, today to be forgiven of our sins, or whether we have been saved decades ago, we are still in need of a Savior. And therefore, Peter's right to say, Save yourself. It reminds us of what we must do. Knowing that you have offended God, and we have. Knowing that you deserve to be cast away from Him. 
then understand that radical change is required. That's what he's calling for that day at Pentecost. As with those men in Jerusalem, radical humility is required. Radical submission. You must humble yourselves to do what God says. And that is radical obedience of the kind that is so rarely seen. Just that simplistic sense. Because the Lord told me to do it, I'll do it. Just do it. Yeah, you know the Nike slogan. And the name Nike and the slogan. Nike means victory. Victory if you just do it. That's what Second Samuel together with Acts 2 really means. God has a plan by which you can be saved if you'll just do it. Right form, right name, right reason. Just do it. Is there anyone here today who in your heart is asking, what shall I do? Really, whether it is for your initial salvation, or like most of us who have been Christians for decades, what do I yet need to do to, to complete the change that God requires of me? What do I need? As I began this lesson, I submit to you, it is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of where you will spend eternity. That's why Jesus is still calling today. Our invitation song reminds us of that. We've been reminded what we need to do. We're reminded now that Jesus is still tenderly calling you to do what you must do to be saved. The promise is sure. The gospel is sure. God's working through Christ is certain. If we'll do what we must do. So as you have need of a Savior today, won't you respond as we stand and sing?